On this month's In the Life, Borders, a war within the war against AIDS. Federal funds cannot be used to directly promote sexual activity. We're going to talk straight about sex to people who need that information. A child caught between countries. The revolution was the biggest thing in my life. And Billie Jean's battle. It was a very tumultuous time in society. Singer Leslie Gore hosts America's gay and lesbian news magazine, In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Arcus Foundation, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, Michael A. Leppin, the Jim Step and Peter Zimmer Funds of the Stonewall Community Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Leslie Gore. Unlike most racial and religious minorities, gays and lesbians are rarely born into cultures that share our experiences as gay and lesbian people. It's even possible that our birth cultures don't have a place for us. We have to find each other and create communities that reflect and support the LGBT elements of our lives. But we do not then cease to be descended from families and birth communities with rich identities of their own, nor do we cease to be a part of broader society. So if we are to be whole people, we often must become living bridges between separate and sometimes seemingly incompatible cultures. Tonight, America's gay and lesbian news magazine explores life on the verge. Gay Hollywood's producing duo. They're the American Gigolo guys, right? Yeah. No, they, uh... They won the Tony for that, didn't it? No, I, yeah, I don't know this guy. What it feels like for a girl. I am a one woman in a one bedroom apartment taking on the black church. And a surprising conclusion from Harvey. There are too many positive gay role models. But first, the political boundaries of healthcare. Correspondent Wayne Barbin reports from the battle lines being drawn inside the AIDS epidemic. There have been a lot of questions around the work that we do. Call them shocking, provocative, even outrageous. The Stop AIDS Project of San Francisco calls them effective. To Shana Krokmal, the organization's communications director, they're a blessing and a curse. The audits and the investigations have been about politics and not about public health. The Stop AIDS Project has been investigated twice in the last two years by the Department of Health and Human Services. Why? The organization's edgy approach to HIV prevention. We know that 20 years into the epidemic, what it takes to catch the eye of a guy walking down Castro Street is liable to raise an eyebrow in Washington. That's okay. We're not here targeting safer sex messages for teenagers in, say, Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're here talking to the gay and bisexual men of San Francisco, and we know that it's important to be relevant. We have to look and sound like the men who we're trying to reach. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention charges workshops with titles like Great Sex, Bootylicious, and Men for Hire actually promote sex. For an organization that receives federal funding, that's against the law. There are certain restrictions put on our funding by the United States Congress. One of them specifically says that federal funds cannot be used to directly promote sexual activity, whether that's homosexual or heterosexual. Dr. Ron Valdeseri is deputy director of the CDC's National Center for HIV, STD, and TB prevention. He says Stop AIDS has been investigated and audited, but he also acknowledges that in each case, the organization was cleared. Shana Krokmal calls the scrutiny harassment. 
we need the CDC to talk straight to us because we're going to talk straight about sex to people who need that information. And what we need to continue to be able to do the work that we're doing is a very clear and consistent set of guidelines about what they're going to have a problem with. Some community-based organizations say Stop AIDS has become a lightning rod in a firestorm raging between liberal safe sex messages and conservative ideology in the current administration. It's a war being waged on a number of fronts, including the question of what defines obscenity. Our members are nervous, they're afraid, and they're also frustrated because they're not allowed to continue on their research that can help us gain the information that can make a healthy, informed decision based on science. The New York Times broke the story. Certain words can trip up AIDS grants. Words like sex workers, men who sleep with men, anal sex, transgender, and gay. Several HIV researchers whose work relies on grants through the National Institutes of Health said they've been warned by government health officials to clean up their grant applications, purging such so-called sensitive language. I've heard from individuals who work at organizations who receive grants from the government who work in the field of sexuality or HIV AIDS or any kind of advocacy that runs counter to um, the current administration's ideology who have been sub subjected to uh, additional audit and additional um, oversight. Nearly 90 organizations representing more than 2 million researchers, scientists, and advocates have signed a petition asking Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson not to blur the line between politics and public health. Primarily because of uh, some of our uh, moral belief systems that have developed over the years, anything to do with sex is frightening, uh, more so in the U.S. than almost any other developed country. Naturally, we came here to the National Institutes of Health for a response to the concerns of censorship. They sent us to the Department of Health and Human Services, the agency which oversees the NIH. There, we were told that the allegations are completely untrue and sent back here to the NIH, which, after originally offering to provide a written response, later called and said they couldn't do that. In the world of politics, all it takes is a little momentum to kind of change the composition of policy. And now Congress is getting involved. The House Government Reforms Committee's Special Investigations Division recently released a report entitled Politics and Science in the Bush Administration. It accuses the government of, quote, manipulating, distorting, and interfering with science in a number of instances, blaming in part a political and ideological agenda. Among the examples cited, quote, at NIH, officials have told scientists who study HIV and AIDS to prepare for political interference with their research. The White House issued a strong denial following the report, saying, quote, this administration looks at the facts and reviews the best available science based on what's right for the American people. The epidemic has changed since 1981, and we have to change with it. Back in Atlanta, Dr. Valdeseri and others have recently released a new initiative, focusing on those who are HIV positive. It's called Advancing HIV Prevention, or AHP. The focus of the initiative is to reach out to those estimated 250,000 persons in America who are infected with HIV and don't know it. The new program will make HIV testing a routine part of medical care in people considered at risk. Our studies show that the majority of new infections in the U.S. are occurring from people who are infected with HIV and don't know it, and they're engaging in unsafe sex and other activities that transmit the virus. So what we want to do is work with these folks to get them diagnosed early. It's good for their own medical care. It's also very good from a prevention point of view. Dr. Valdeseri says the new strategy is backed up by sound science. But there's a problem. Like everything else, it costs money. Part of that money will come out of funding for prevention efforts aimed at those who are HIV negative. Efforts like condom distribution, clean IV needle programs, and educational workshops. 
The issue is that those organizations that are uniquely positioned and are best qualified by having the history with uh, the communities that they served may no longer receive the resources they need to keep negatives negatives. That's why we're extremely disturbed. Martin Orneas Quintero is the executive director of Yego, the nation's only nonprofit organization devoted to the needs of the Latino, Latina, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. He thinks the new initiative is unbalanced, and Yego is just one of more than 200 CBOs crying foul. We're very concerned that, you know, in 2003, the, the vision of public health is such a reductionist vision. Ana Oliveira is executive director of the Gay Men's Health Crisis, a national leader in the fight against AIDS. She says the shift to a medical model emphasizing testing for HIV and treatment for those who test positive is fraught with problems, not the least of which is financial. It really means that the government kind of will, is announcing to us that we are shifting away from this other emphasis of community education, community prevention, HIV negative prevention. Since 2001, we've been on record as saying, and this is with extensive input from the communities, that we've got to start doing a better job for ongoing prevention for people who are positive. That's, that's not new. To fund AHP, the CDC plans to pull more than $35 million out of primary prevention programs we should be having major campaigns, billboard campaigns, subway campaigns, um, educational campaigns in schools. We should be having ongoing, ongoing information giving around HIV and AIDS embedded in the lives of people, not just segregated out in some institutions, but on the daily lives of pe people, embedded in the daily lives of people. And. Um, not emphasizing that is a major mistake. First of all, our overall HIV prevention budget is over $800 million. So you have to put $35 million in perspective compared to $800 million. The uh, majority of our resources do, in fact, target high-risk seronegative persons. Where it becomes difficult is when we, the CDC expresses that it is in the medical encounter that HIV prevention counseling will take place. Traditionally, we know that our medical system is tremendously overburdened. I mean, physicians, um, physician visits, certainly in the public system, tend to be underpaid to deliver the kind of quality care that's already needed. In order to push for a balance between prevention efforts in those who are HIV negative and those who are positive, representatives of a number of community-based organizations met with Dr. Valdeseri and other CDC officials. The result? An admission by the CDC that it was wrong in the way it announced the new AHP initiative. Our communities are the experts. We built the AIDS movement. We built the AIDS infrastructure. We know what we're talking about. Now is the time for us to work in partnership with CDC. Part of what we were hearing from those organizations is, CDC, you're presenting this initiative in such a way that you're inadvertently sending a message that you only care about people after they become infected with HIV. That was a pretty important message for us to hear because, first of all, that's not true. Uh, that is not where we're coming from, but we need to do a better job of communicating. Still, investigations continue at a number of organizations focused on HIV and sex education. Normally, this many audits don't happen, and the reason is this group focuses on comprehensive sexuality education. They talk about prevention, they talk about use of condoms, and that is something that uh, the current administration is not real keen on. Dr. Valdeseri says all this has nothing to do with politics or ideology and everything to do with accountability to the American public. America in general is bored with AIDS, which is unfortunate. We're still talking about a deadly, incurable, sexually transmissible disease, but most Americans think it's no longer a problem. And quite frankly, because they think that, they want to know what dollars are being used for. Still, the question many LGBT and mainstream health organizations are asking is whether there's a common thread running through all three of these issues. We can talk about diabetes. We can talk about um, cancer. 
easier than we can talk about AIDS and HIV in this society. The bottom line is that um, CDC is not backing away from working with community-based organizations like Stop AIDS. They are vital uh, and necessary to a comprehensive approach to preventing HIV. Stop AIDS could not agree more. They're not letting up on the work that is their mission and their passion. And their safe sex messages will continue as is. Messages like HIV is no picnic to drive home the ravages of risky behavior. And despite what she sees as a campaign of intimidation, Shana Krokmal says that her program will continue to cooperate with the federal government. We're not chasing a money trail. We're not here to get more bucks out of the federal government or to cheat the taxpayers. We are here to help people save their lives and save the lives of the friends and lovers who they care about. It was back in 1992 when I first moved to L.A. that I stumbled into a group uh, called Project Angel Food. They were serving meals for people living with HIV and AIDS, and I became a volunteer and eventually a board member and found that was a great way to make an amends to my own ex-lover who had died in 1989. I'm Paris Barkley, and you're watching In the Life. In Hollywood, where art and business and politics often intersect, two producers find themselves at another juncture, one where their gay identities meet the mainstream. Well, but which... Bruce Cohn and Dan yeah, Jinks yeah, are young, successful, and openly gay. And they're two of the busiest movie producers in Hollywood. We're talking about Bruce and Dan. Because it's... Why? <laughs> Why would anyone talk about them? They're the American Gigolo guys, right? Yeah. No, they, uh... They won the Tony for that. I was making movies from the time I was a little kid, and I was always turning school projects into slideshows and eight millimeter films. It never occurred to me until college that you could actually do that for a living. I was not a particularly happy kid for a while. I always felt like I just didn't fit in. But from a very, very young age, I had this ridiculous fascination with, with uh, entertainment in general. After graduating from Yale, Bruce started to work in the industry, first in distribution, and then as a second assistant director. His first picture was Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple. Working on The Color Purple was just a completely amazing experience and met a lot of incredible people who sort of went on to shape the rest of my career in many ways. Bruce continued to work with Spielberg on Always and Hook. Eventually, he started to produce films such as Alive, The Flintstones, and Tu Wang Fu. When I came to Los Angeles, I was out. But in my professional life, that was another story because, again, this was the 80s and people just weren't out at work. When I went and told Steven, to me, I really saw that as my coming out professionally because I worked for Steven Spielberg and he knew, so I sort of it didn't really matter to me if anyone else had a problem with it. Dan's first love was theater in eighth grade living in Miami that I started to work at a children's theater. And that was a big turning point for me in so many ways. I found people who were like me. Following graduation from NYU, Dan began working in the theater, but quickly moved to film. When I first uh, moved to Los Angeles, I wasn't sure how comfortable people were discussing their sexuality. Turning point for me was, and kind of how I got to know Bruce, was Bruce and a woman named Nina Jacobson, who now runs Walt Disney Pictures, co-formed an organization called Out There. We got this idea of could we create an organization of out gay and lesbian activists in Hollywood. And the first meeting actually was held at my house. And uh, we had a few meetings, and we got a lot of attention. And Out Magazine wanted to take a picture of the steering committee. And it was one of those things where I said, well, God, I don't know if I want to be in a publication saying that I'm gay. And then I thought, well, you know what? If there's one kid in, in Milwaukee who sees this group of people and, and sees that, wow, these people are all successful and they're open about their sexuality, then that's going to give me the courage. I know that sounds sort of pretentious to say, but that was my thinking at that, at that moment in time. There's a long tradition in the entertainment in industry of um, producers and directors and executives getting very involved in fundraising activities and in political activities. Um, so, but that had never been gay oriented before, but it was a logical next step. In 1998, Dan and Bruce decided to combine their talents and form a new production company called Jinx 
Cohen. The huge, wonderful stroke of luck of our entire career uh, was that an agent gave us a screenplay called American Beauty by this pretty unknown screenwriter named Alan Ball. And um, that just sort of changed our lives forever. A lot of people wanted to buy American Beauty. Uh, and um, I met with every one of them. And the thing about Dan and Bruce is, is, first of all, they were so enthusiastic. I read a fair number of scripts, and I thought that it was the best script that I'd ever read. If you don't complain, what is this? Yeah, let's, let's, let's bring in the laugh meter and see how loud it gets on that one. You don't complain. Don't interrupt me, honey. And second of all, they, I said to them, well, I, wanna, I don't want to be, you know, shut out of the process. This is an incredibly personal piece of work, and I want to be able to be a part of this process so I can learn. And they said, absolutely, we, we give you our word that that will happen. And it did. Again, you know, somebody sticking to their word, that's rare in Hollywood. <laughs> in 1999, American Beauty went on to win five Academy Awards, including Best Picture. You know, winning the Academy Award was the most exciting and, frankly, most surreal thing that ever happened to either of us in our lives. Well, here we were, two guys in our, in our 30s, uh, getting up on stage and looking out at the audience, and there in the front row is Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise and Meryl Streep, and it, it was just this kind of mind-boggling outer body experience. I can say now, without reservation, that the actual experience far exceeded any fantasy or dream of it that, that I could ever have had. Their follow-up features to American Beauty were Down With Love, an homage to the sex comedies of the 1960s, and Big Fish, directed by Tim Burton. Both Dan and Bruce are also politically active. I did my first door-to-door -door campaign for a Democratic candidate when I was four years old. And I have been a political junkie ever since. We really have our roughest and scariest years ahead of us in the gay and lesbian rights movement. What's coming up on the road to equality is much scarier for America. The right to marry, the right to adopt children. I'm co-hosting a, a fundraiser for Howard Dean, who's running for president, who, and I think is the most outspoken for homosexual rights candidate um, we've, we've had. So given their activism, are these two members of the infamous gay mafia? Well, we, you know, we've been shooting a movie, so we've missed some of the, the meetings of the gay mafia. I think the fact that there are so many gay people in Hollywood now who are, there's so many divergent groups of friends that I think the whole expression gay mafia is, uh, is a pretty dated uh, expression, and uh, I've never seen any evidence of, of it existing. I have a feeling that being gay in Hollywood is probably um, helped me as much as it's hurt me. There are... Dinner parties that I'm invited to because I'm gay. And the same way, there are these straight macho guys who go on rafting trips together uh, that where business is being done subtly that I'm not invited on because they don't invite the gay guy. So, you know, I, I think probably it all evens out. I really credit the Clinton campaign in 92 as one of the watershed moments that really changed the situation of, of gays in Hollywood as far as whether they were out or not. And a lot of people came out around that uh, period and in the years since. But um, in, in 1990, there weren't a lot of people out in Hollywood. It's been really exciting over the last decade to see how dramatically the landscape has changed in this town and how people who were not very open to, to working with, with gay people in their workplace, that, that's just, you can't do that anymore. The borders that affect our lives most deeply aren't always those between ourselves and the mainstream, but often lie within us, where our LGBT and our cultural identities meet. By documenting the untold stories of black lesbians, one writer has set out to unearth the chasm between race and sexuality and gender, and in that process, she may have found a way to reconcile her competing identities. I would call my approach grassroots. I would also uh, call my approach DIY, do-it-yourself. DC-based Lisa Moore helms Redbone Press, one of the only black lesbian publishing houses around. Lisa Moore's passion is connecting people with information. So when she recognized the limited number of books available to young black lesbians, Redbone Press was born.
It was like 1995 that a, a friend of my younger sister, she had come out to herself, but she didn't know anybody else. So she came and she's seeing all the books on my bookshelf and she says, do you have anything about black lesbians? And I thought, well, I've got homegirls. And she said, oh, I've seen that. And then I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be a book of like coming out stories for black lesbians. But I discovered that there was none. So I kind of put it in my head that, well, I could, I could at least put them together and shop it around. And what ended up happening was that I published the book myself. 1997 yielded Redbone's first effort, the anthology Does Your Mama Know, a two-time Lambda Literary Award winner. There are 49 stories by 41 writers, and they basically are poems, letters, essays, and they are the stories of people coming out to neighbors, mothers, friends, sisters, lovers, and, you know, people being okay with that. The title, Does Your Mama Know? It's very germane to what the book is about. I mean, if your mama knows, everything's okay. I had women who were grandmothers that said, where was this book when I was coming out? You know, I got married, had kids, divorced my husband. I've got grandkids, and I wish that this book was there. I've had women come up to me in the past year and say, I love your book, I just got it last week. You know, it helped me come out to my mom. You know, and I'm just happy to have been able to help facilitate that. And Bull Jean, love her. Go get you, any After unveiling the coming out stories of Mama, Sundays, Redbone's focus shifted to the Bull Jean stories, an out and proud Southern celebration from Sharon Bridgeforth. Put sweet out myself. Sweet ain't got me nothing but left. The Bull Jean stories was about the character Bulldog Jean and her life and loves. But within the stories, she's very ensconced in her community. She's not ostracized at all. She's walking down the street. They say, hey, how you doing? You know, everybody knows who she is, and she knows who they are. It's not like she lives on the edge of town, you know, and nobody talks about her. People whisper about her. It's not that at all. In her ongoing reclamation of history, Moore is venturing into new personal territory, the documentary film. It's called Sassy Be Gone, Searching for Black Lesbian Elders. I don't want you to think there was no homophobia, that it was easy being, you know, no. And as I say, in the church, mm -hmm. there, the, you could know, you know, the choir director or the musician or the organ player or whatever, whatever, was a gay guy. But where were the lesbians? My mother would be saying things like, don't you be making fun of her? And I'd be thinking, making fun of her? Lord, if you only knew what was going through my head, I want to run out there and hold her hand and walk up the street with her. I was interviewing older black lesbians in their 60s, 70s, and 80s and asking them about what being a black lesbian was like during segregation and after segregation. It wasn't our time to be outspoken, but it's your time to be outspoken. Mm -hmm. So do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we did what we could when we was coming up. We got away with uh, as much as we could. Mm -hmm. We would be scared to walk down the street holding hands. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I see it all the time. People really, really respond to it, especially young people, because they want to know what it's going to be like being old. They don't know that there's people that have lived through some things that they could tell them about. Inundated with questions from fellow writers looking to publish, Moore and her colleagues organized Fire and Ink, a writers' conference that aims to provide support to LGBT writers of color. We had people that wanted to publish. We had self-publishers there. We had performance artists there. We had poets there. We had playwrights there. We had screenwriters there. And they all came together to talk about writing, talk about getting your work out there, talk about the actual writing process as well as the business of it, talk about how to network, talk about how to get our work into academia, because getting work into academia ensures its longevity. People came out of workshops crying because they had to write things and they had never been in such an affirming place before where they could be all of themselves and be black and gay and lesbian or trans or bi, you know, and write about what they wanted to write about and have people support that. And now Redbone faces perhaps its biggest challenge to date, Spirited. A collection of essays on religion and spirituality is Moore's latest project and it promises to attract attention. And there's so many black, gay, and lesbian people that go to church week after week and have it pounded into their heads that the Bible hates this, the Bible says, the Bible says. 
if you come out as a gay or lesbian person in a black community, you risk being ostracized from that community. And if community is what gives you strength and you risk being shut out, a lot of gay and lesbian people will just not come out. And it's just kind of blowing my mind in the past few days of editing this book that, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I am a one woman in a one bedroom apartment taking on the black church. I think that the work that I do connects people with information that is so necessary. It's necessary for people's survival, if you will, for them to know that it's okay to be all of who they are and be black and be gay and be lesbian. The late Bayard Rustin fought passionately to give a voice to the African-American civil rights movement. He wrote the first Civil Rights Act, organized the March on Washington, and was integral in bringing nonviolence to the movement, the same movement that forced him out because his gayness was a political liability. I'm Andre DeShields, and you're watching In the Life. Still to come on In the Life, a child of the Marielle boat lift. One of my uncles came back with a boat and wanted the rest of my family to come to the States. How Billie Jean King changed America. I didn't go pro, we created professional tennis. And Harvey doubles back. In our effort to remove the stigma of having AIDS, have we created a culture of disease? Only 90 miles of water separates Cuba and the United States. Yet making that journey has left generations of immigrants psychically stranded between countries and between deeply held ideologies. For gay filmmaker Juan Carlos Zaldivar, it was leaving his beloved Cuba and coming to America that also allowed him to come out. So if for him, these two cultures preclude one another, how can he locate his identity and his home? In tonight's Real to Real, 90 Miles. In 1980, I was a 13-year-old communist living in Cuba. The revolution was the biggest thing in my life, bigger than religion or anything else. I was raised a communist, and so was my sister, and we never, the idea of leaving the island or deserting the revolution was never really uh, put forth by my parents, so I, I just assumed that they were as much for the revolution as we were. In 1980, more than 125,000 Cubans were allowed to immigrate to the United States in what became known as the Marielle Boat Lift, an historic event that began when thousands of Cubans stormed several embassies and demanded political asylum. Fidel appeared on television and declared that all those people were parasites of the revolution. And if they wanted to leave the island, they could leave. In Miami, the Cuban community in exile immediately started sending boats over to take their families to the United States. Over 200 tiny fiberglass boats left Key West to date. Most know they will wait with several thousand other boats in Mariel Bay for two weeks to a month before being allowed to board their refugee passengers for the 90-mile passage. The Mariel boat lift happened in 1980. It became a very important event in Cuban history. It also became a very important event in my life. That spring, instead of going to school, my class would join demonstrations that publicly humiliated the people who were deserting. They were called acts of hate. We'd build bonfires and we'd make dummies out of uniforms that people left behind. We would stuff them with their pillows and then we would burn them. One of my uncles came back with a boat and uh, wanted the rest of my family that was still living in Cuba to come to the United States. And uh, at that point, my father gave the decision of whether my family would leave to, to me and to my older sister. I was angry. I didn't want to leave. I said to them, how could you take us to a place where I'll be forced to take drugs in school, where you can't go out alone at night, and where my grandparents won't be able to see a doctor if they get sick? And 
My father raised me a communist, I think, to protect me because he felt that that was the best way that I could evolve and, and, and become somebody in that society. But at the same time, by not believing that, he created this rift between him and I. I understood it all, I think, best when I was in Cuba in 1999. And while I was there, the Elian Gonzalez demonstrations started. And I understood, I think, watching the watching all of the the propaganda that was being fed and all of the rhetoric that was being said at the at the demonstration. As an adult, how difficult it must have been for him, having raised a child, believing something that he didn't believe. When I got to Miami, I didn't find the United States to be the way that I expected it. I was able to go out at night. I wasn't being mugged or raped or killed. It was clean, and my cousins were nice. The other thing that contributed to the distance between my father and I was the process of immigration. Ironically, you know, he was the one that had all the aspirations, and I didn't want to leave, but because I was younger, I adapted easier, and he had a harder time adapting to the United States. He was all of a sudden raising a kid that was speaking another, was learning another language faster than he was, and uh, was assimilating to that new culture that he couldn't assimilate. When it was time for college, I immediately decided to leave Miami. In New York, I gathered the courage to kiss another boy for the first time. I wanted to develop my own identity, and I couldn't do that in Miami. Life in Miami thrived on keeping things the way they used to be. My mother and my sisters were supportive, but I was worried about how my father would react to my attraction to another man. I was afraid that he would think that I had been lying to him all my life. His response surprised me. Es bueno que entre más temprano que más que tarde sabe las cosas y resolverlas. Y hay más tiempo. Hay más tiempo de madurar uno con el otro y el otro con el otro. Ya mucho. Y yo no. ¿Tú crees que no? Sí, no, yo sí. Ah, un I was ready for it to become a big issue. And when it wasn't, I, I felt, wow, that's, uh, that, that's not only really great, and I'm very lucky to have that in my life, but it's also uh, um, really interesting how, despite all the other differences that exist between him and I, you know, that which is normally the biggest rift between a, and a father and a son, uh, wasn't. I find really interesting the correlations between uh, the whole process of coming out or acceptance of something like homosexuality in our society and all the parallels that exist in, in us accepting other types of changes in our lives, particularly in, in this case, the process of immigration. We reject change, and part of it is because it asks us to question ourselves and sort of reinvent ourselves. And I think most people don't want to do that because it's something that you have to take on. It's going to take a little while to reevaluate and to come up to a new place where you feel comfortable again. <laughs> After my first trip to Cuba in 1998, I think the emotional impact for me was uh, feeling that sense of uh, nearness and sort of uh, togetherness with the people, my family that was there, and really having that feeling that I belonged there and that I, uh, there was no question about it. I decided at that moment that I was going to try to find a way to make a, to make to make a that bridge for myself, and I didn't really know how it was going to be. Um, so far, I think it, it has been this movie really that has created that. You know, the film did play in Cuba uh, in 2001. And then we got a call a week later that we won the Havana Film Festival. We got the Best Documentary Award. And that, to me, was, you know, was sort of close to circle, because um, even though, yes, there was a huge difference between the two countries, um, the film managed to speak to an experience that is the same on both ends of the story. Hi, I'm Lisa Leslie of the World Champion Los Angeles Sparks, and you're watching In the Life. Billie Jean King wanted to be a professional athlete, 
but the governing political, social, and athletic institutions had no place for a female pro. Billie Jean rose to the challenge, creating bridges between her identities as athlete and as woman. She became one of tennis's greatest legends, and with her tennis game, she changed the culture. By the time I was 12 years old, that because of my gender, that I was discounted. In the 1950s, 1960s, there were very few opportunities for girls to play sports. The girls' basketball team played a grand total of four games per season uh, and only played against neighboring institutions. There were no such things as state high school championships or national collegiate championships. So I think it's fair to say that it was uh, a desert for uh, women in sport. When I played, nobody really knew what I was doing and didn't care. They just knew I was going every weekend away to a tournament. And everybody would go, why are you doing that? That is so stupid. You should be with us going to slumber parties. By 1966, she was the number one ranked female player in a sport that had no professional league. Billie Jean hammered away at the glass ceiling, pushing for unification and equal opportunity. I didn't go pro, we created professional tennis. There was a group of us in 1970 called the Original Nine. We signed a $1 contract with Gladys Hellman, who at the time was um, publisher of World Tennis Magazine. She went out and got the money from Philip Morris to be the, the sponsor. And that's the reason we were able to have women's professional tennis the way everyone knows it today. Serena, Venus, Lindsay, Monica, we're the ones that started that. The birth of the Virginia Slims tournament would give rise to the women's professional tennis tour and to financial independence for players on the tour, a luxury king and the original nine labored for. We knew we weren't going to be the, the big winners in this whole thing. We knew the next generations were going to be the big ones. I made one million nine something. Chris Everett made eight or nine million. Martina made 20 million. And now we don't know where these other ones are going to go. The 70s saw an enormous push for legislative change. One of the most important laws was Title IX of the 1972 Educational Amendments, which mandated that educational programs receiving federal funds not discriminate on the basis of sex. It was a grand slam for King, who was a key lobbyist for the amendment. Before 1972, which is me, pre-Title IX, I couldn't get a, an athletic scholarship to college, whereas my counterpart, a guy, a man, a, a male, could. Women weren't admitted to law schools, weren't admitted to uh, medical schools. People forget that in you know, 1972, if you wanted a, a credit card, you had to get your father or your husband to sign an application. While feminists celebrated the victory and the WPT evolved, former number one men's tennis player Bobby Riggs plotted a media event that would be unparalleled in ABC sports history. Sports, live from the Astrodome in Houston, Texas, the tennis battle of the sexes, Billie Jean King versus Bobby Riggs. It was at the height of the women's movement. We had Watergate heating up, Vietnam cooling down. We had Roe versus Wade. It was a very tumultuous time um, in society. After repeatedly dodging his challenge, King finally accepted after Riggs' highly publicized match with the top female player. I only played him because he beat Margaret Court in the same year. She was number one in the world in 1973. He beat her very badly, very soundly. And after she lost to Bobby Riggs, then I had to play. The male is king, the male is supreme. I've said it over and over again. I still feel that way. Girls play a nice game of tennis for girls. 50 million television viewers watched as the circus-like event played out in the public eye. Jerry Perincho, the promoter, said, would you get on this Egyptian litter? Because he thought I wouldn't. And I said, absolutely, it's showtime, let's go. Just to show you how Billy Dean King has been approaching this match in her own mind as she gleefully, even joyously, waves to the fans. You know, there's a sense of entertainment around this, and I like that.
Billie Jean's next high-profile event was of a slightly different nature. In 1981, a palimony suit brought by her former lover outed Billie Jean, threatening not only her financial security, but also the vitality of the women's tour. I'd just gotten all these fantastic endorsements. I was just gonna retire, and uh, this was when I finally was gonna get, get to cash in on the big bucks of those, of those days. I mean, now it'd be such a small amount, but it was millions. And if you're new to Virginia Slims, these ladies play the best two out of three. The sponsors of the women's tour were very nervous. You know, this is 20 years ago we're talking about, and, uh, you know, sexuality was not talked about, and Billie Jean was the biggest star. Beautiful. Oh, are we seeing some outstanding tennis? Everybody said if I said anything, they wouldn't have the tour. I mean, that is a major responsibility, I think. But with a lawsuit making the daily papers, Billie Jean acknowledged the affair and went on to publicly embrace her sexual identity. Oh, beautiful. What an angle. I would never out somebody because everybody has to do it in their own time. But I'm glad I'm out. But I probably would have done it in my own, my own way, in my own time. But it's okay. The truth sets you free, that's for sure. And also, I'm a capable person. I can still work, and I do world team tennis now, and you know, I, I found other ways to, to make a living. King has continued her fight for equality well into her so-called retirement, co-founding the Women's Sports Foundation. And with executive director Donna Lopiano, the foundation is tackling some major issues. The reason I created it is because um, trying to help change attitudes and also create participation and leadership opportunities for girls. One of uh, our recent projects has been to attack homophobia in sport. It has become common practice for uh, people who don't want girls to play to label female athletes as lesbians. And for some girls, that deters them from playing. And the Women's Sports Foundation is only one of the many reverberations of Billie Jean's famous victory. It wasn't about sport. It was more um, about you know, the public realizing that women don't fold under pressure. It gave women a lot more self-esteem. A lot of women asked for a raise for the first time the next day at work um, and got it. Um, I have people tell me every single day of my life since that match. Every single day I got in public, somebody has a story to tell me about that match. It went beyond tennis. It went beyond sports. It really, I think, empowered women in a way that Gloria Steinem couldn't imagine. Uh, and, and I know Billy was trying to tell her that sports and, and social change were intertwined. And, and Gloria didn't quite get it then, but I think she gets it now because uh, qu quite often I think sports was a precursor to social change. And finally, in outtakes, Harvey's own take on a fight he holds dear. So what ha -ha happened was, these words are making me nervous. <laughs> what ha -ha happened was, you're in my key light. Well, so far that's not offensive. <laughs> Come on, Papa, what do you say? I bet you never thought you'd ever hear me say this. There are too many positive gay role models. Here's the thing. Over the last 20 years, fighting the AIDS crisis, we've done everything possible to dispel the negative connotations that came with being HIV positive. After all, it's been our relatives, our friends, our boyfriends and girlfriends, ourselves, who are being discriminated against because of a virus. We had enough trouble staying alive without suffering the manifold prejudices laid on us by those who knew no better. So. We produced advertising, created enlightenment programs, spent endless hours making certain that having AIDS or being HIV positive was nothing to be ashamed of. We did a great job, maybe too great a job. After all the effort exerted to convince the world that AIDS is not a gay disease, we now have a generation embracing AIDS as their gay birthright. Our young men are zero-converting in rising numbers. Four Americans are becoming infected every hour. Many see HIV as a rite of passage, an inevitable coming of age in their lives. I hear of young people seeking the disease, zero-converting by choice as an entree into the cool, queer inner circle that being negative denies them. My question. 
In our effort to remove the stigma of having AIDS, have we created a culture of disease? We all see the ads for HIV drugs. They illustrate hot, muscular men living life to the fullest thanks to modern science. Other ads showing couples holding hands, sending the message that the road to true love and happiness is being HIV positive. Is the message, you're going to be okay, which is terrific, or is the message we're sending, you want to be special, get AIDS. HIV equals popularity and acceptance, which would be tragic. And let me state in no uncertain terms, my heart goes out to all who have the infection and the complications and the struggles. And while I pledge my energies and resources to the fight for a cure and continued care and justice for all those with the disease, I still think we need to examine what we're teaching our gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual youth. In my viewpoint, the messages the drug companies are now spreading are lies. The truth is that AIDS is not fun. AIDS is not sexy. AIDS is not manageable. AIDS is a progressive, aggressive, debilitating, deforming, terminal, and still incurable disease. The drugs can bring on heart disease, kidney and liver disease, and a host of daily discomforts. I'd like to see that painted on the entrance to a bareback party. Unlike the photos in those ads, most of my friends who are on cocktails are not having the time of their lives. They spend their mornings in the bathroom throwing up or suffering with diarrhea. They spend their afternoons at doctor's appointments and clinics and pharmacies. And they spend endless evenings planning their estates and trying to make ends meet because for long periods of time, they are not well enough to support themselves and their new drug habit. And those are just the friends for whom the drugs work. For most women, the cocktails are nothing but a drain on finance, internal organs, and stamina. And even if the drugs worked as well as they are selling them, should we be creating a community of drug dependency? Dear listeners, we have done a terrific job removing the stigma of having AIDS from the general culture. But in doing so, we become failures at removing the disease from our community. HIV is an almost completely avoidable infection. It's hard to get. No one can just hand it to you. You need to be compliant in some very specific behaviors to be at risk. In fact, if every person now infected vowed that the disease ended with them, we could wipe out the ballooning number of new infections from our community. But instead, we're selling our next generation into drug slavery and their destiny to medical researchers, all because we'd rather treat each other as sexual objects than family. And thanks to the powerful drug companies who are making billions off of us and the medical community that's gained a whole new captive audience to fill their appointment books, and thanks to AIDS charities that have become a career for many, we have created an industry of disease that would crumble if AIDS was cured or wiped out of our community. I'm calling for us to stop spreading the virus. I am calling for us to resist the normalization of disease and once again embrace health. I'm calling for an end to the false advertising for drugs. I'm calling for us to stop minimizing the infection with cute little names like the gift or the bug. I want to see an ad campaign showing a hot, sexy man saying, I don't have AIDS. I don't want to waste my life and my resources on drugs. I am taking charge of my body, my health, and my destiny. I am a negative role model. I'm Leslie Gore. For all of us at In the Life here at OW Bar in New York, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month.
in the life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Arcus Foundation, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, Michael A. Leppin, the Jim Stepp and Peter Zimmer Funds of the Stonewall Community Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.